Hello, my friend. Welcome to our channel. In this video we are going to tell you about, Oro, Plata, Mata, released on January 27, 1982 with director Peke Galiaga. Peke Galiaga, a brilliant Filipino director, has a lengthy career. However, he is most known for two works, an erotic narrative called, Scorpio Nights, and a World War II upper-class sad family drama called, Oro, Plata, Mata. Galiaga was born into an upper-class mestizo family, bringing historical fact to life on the big screen. Oro, Plata, Mata, Spanish for, Gold, Silver, Death, is a 1982 Philippine historical war drama film directed by Pec Galiaga, based on a screenplay by Jose Javier Reyes and a narrative by Pec Galiaga, Mario Tagiwalo, and Conchita Castillo. Galaga's most significant contribution to Philippine cinema is regarded as this picture. It is set during World Conflict II on the Philippine island of Negros and chronicles the narrative of two Hacendero families coping with the upheavals brought about by the war. The film is also known as, Gold, Silver, Bad Luck, or, Gold, Silver, Death, in translation. In K.K. Galaga's, Oro, Plata, Mata, we get a glimpse of pre-war upper-class life in the opening moments. According to K.K. Galaga's audio commentary, he instructed the film's scriptwriter, Jose Javier Reyes, to establish a frame reference for the film, and the latter responded by citing a quotation from Nick Joaquin. K.K. supported the choice and stated that he appreciated reading these works. The opening quote reads, The lights went out all over Europe and the young sought sweetness and light in the pictures of Dina Durban, a bright symbol of the era, and the young Susan Magalona, whose beauty had become a national topic. At the Crystal Arcade, the mezzanine still rang with the cries of, Gold! 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 The Holocaust had been kindled, but the victims were unaware, and the nation swung confidently into the 1940s. The decade of disaster fell into three unequal parts. The two years before the war, the period of the Japanese occupation, and the liberation era. No decade in our history was more eventual than this one. So vast now seems the difference between what we have become and what we were before disaster struck that, in the Philippine vernacular term, peacetime, means exclusively all the years before December 8, 1941. There has been no peacetime since then. Oro, Plata, Mata, is a war narrative similar to Gone with the Wind, in that it is told from the perspective of individuals on the perimeter who are deeply impacted by the cruelty of war. The title of the film tells us all we need to know about it. The title alludes to a traditional Spanish-Filipino architectural superstition that states that design features in a house, especially stairs, should not terminate in a multiple of three, in accordance with a pattern of oro, gold, plata, silver, and mata, bad luck. The film is divided into three sections that depict how this pattern plays out in the lives of the main characters, beginning with a life of luxury and comfort in the city, oro, gold. Continuing with a still luxurious time of refuge in a provincial hacienda, Plata Silver, and finally retreating deeper into the mountains, where they are victimized by guerrilla bandits, Mata, Bad Luck. Oro denotes gold, Plata denotes silver, while Mata denotes ill luck. It alludes to an old Filipino superstition that design features in a house, particularly stairs, should not terminate in trees. As a result, the film is separated into three sections. During a beautiful, gold, season, we meet our primary protagonists, the upper-class families of Ojeda and Lorenzo. The opening few minutes of the video are spent with the camera panning about a lavish home, with the nicely dressed individuals dancing and having a good time. We saw training Ojeda's first kiss with her childhood sweetheart Miguel Lorenzo in the yard. There are other symptoms of war, such as young enlisted soldiers donning uniforms. They also make fun of Miguel Lorenzo for not joining the army because of his overprotective mother. Some older men are talking about war. Most of them are cocky and certain that the conflict will be over soon. 
Only the elderly Ojeda recognizes the true nature of the threat and begins making preparations. The news of Corregidor's fall to the Japanese breaks the celebration's joy, and the party dissembles. The innocence of Oro in the narrative is portrayed by the first kiss in the garden. The silver epoch begins. To escape the fighting, the Lorenzos urge the Ojedas to join them in their rural ranch. They play mahjong and put reality at a way while yet surrounded by luxury and servants. However, reality strikes again, and they are forced to flee to Lorenzo's mountain refuge and begin the bad luck era. For a while, the location appears to be tranquil and pleasurable. Children play in the woods and swim in streams, as servants prepare the food against a backdrop of wildness. But war strikes again. Guerrilla warriors first pay them a visit. Families look after them and cure their wounds. And Miguel is forced to give up his prized telescope for the sake of the warriors. When the Ojeda home overseer, Melker, turns against them, disaster hits. He informs the women that he is weary of being treated like a slave while they play mahjong and contribute nothing to their own existence. Later, he returns with some other rebels and murders the other servants, steals the valuables and food, mistreats the ladies, and kidnaps Trining Ojeda. Later, they are served payback in the shape of a bloodbath. Delivered by a man up Miguel and a guerrilla fighter. The film concludes on a bright note, the war is over, life goes on, but they will never regain their innocence. The Mahjong game is a crucial aspect of the film because it keeps the women tied to their upper-class identities during difficult times. It's also an unusual aspect of Filipino society, whereas most things there are influenced by Spanish culture, this one is influenced by Chinese culture. A lot happens throughout the three-hour cinematic experience. It's fascinating to see how the personalities evolve as their situations change. Miguel transforms from an innocent mama's son to a guy who was introduced into manhood by the commission of a slaughter. Training from a pure girl transforms him into a cunning sexual predator. We watch how privileged females become stronger when their lives are threatened. Oro, Plata, Mata, does not, however, go further into the depths of the human spirit. The film has a few horrific scenes, such as one with mutilated corpses in the wilderness. The most heinous moment, however, was one in which the insurgent Mercurio savagely murders a wounded Japanese soldier who had asked for assistance. Another aspect that appears to be lacking is the post-war character transition. The conflict has transformed us into beasts, Trining says, but there is no proof of this on the surface. Actually, her actions in the film, particularly walking off with the rebels and then defending them while refusing to be saved, baffles. If you're seeking for a, Lord of the Flies, level of human depravity. Oro, Plata, Mata, plays it down. The survivors remain, imprisoned, in their mountain hideout for some time. Their jail is mental, despair, and hopelessness, which is more harmful than physical confinement. Another subject that the film might have explored more is the issue of class strife. Melker, the rebellious servant, makes an excellent point, while the upper class is arrogant and privileged, it is the slaves who have to break their backs to respond to their demands. They are not even acknowledged or adequately compensated for their efforts. It is just expected that things must be this way, and that servants are second-class citizens. While the filmmaker makes fun of upper-class snobbishness, particularly through the absolutely irritating character of Girin, there isn't much of a deeper look at this social reality. Melker appears out of nowhere, shaking the roots of Lorenzo and Ojeda's deeply rooted, long-established balletetry with a force even the Japanese could not muster, the script's failure is to capitalize on that tremor. To show us the darker side of upper-class Negro society as it exploited pianistic servitude to fund its high-maintenance lifestyle. One of the film's most disturbing sequences. Voluntary self-destruction in the face of total despair. 
it was shot on site throughout the Negros Occidental region, particularly in Bacolod City and the Mount Canlaon National Park. The Ministry of National Defense, the Ministry of Tourism, and the Armed Forces of the Philippines have all provided substantial aid and support to the crew. The film's musical soundtrack was composed by Jose Gentica V, the photography was done by Rodi Lacap, and the editing was done by Jesus Navarro. The Philippine National Bank financially sponsored and praised the film's development. Oro, Plata, Mata, won the Orian Han Horse in 1983, fighting against Ishmael Bernal's masterwork, Himala. Himala, is preferable as a full cinematic experience with a big impact, Oro, Plata, Mata, is excellent. According to Alfred A. Yusen, a member of the Film Ratings Board, it easily reaches the top 5 of the best Filipino films list. A 1982 film cast then and now in 2022, so let's get started right away. Number 1. Sherry Gill in 1982 age 18, looking back on her long and successful career in cinema, television, and theater. Sherry Gill demonstrated a skill far more wide and deep than the villain parts that had been synonymous with her movie character. Gill died on Friday at the age of 59 in New York City. Members of her family and show industry acquaintances acknowledge her death on social media, but no other information were provided. The multi-award winning actress, on the other hand, recently posted on Facebook about her confinement at Manhattan's Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where she supposedly had treatment for uterine cancer, an earlier post in February, with a photo of her with a bald, shaved head, detailed her plan to leave the nation and begin a new life in New York. Gill's career spans over half a century. She began her career as a child actor in the 1970s, appearing in films starring her mother Rosemary Gill such as the horror fantasy, Cofredia, 1973, and the more adult theme, Elwood Perez directed, Beer House, 1977. By the end of the decade, she was 17, and it was her turn to play the lead in another erotic melodrama by Perez, Problem Child, 1980, alongside Lloyd Sammartino. That film, as well as others she worked on with Regal Entertainment, may be watched on the studio's website but it was Ishmael Bernal's Manila by Night, released the same year, that gave Gil his big break. Bernal made that picture as his pal Lino Bracca was releasing a string of politically heated melodramas. However, it was Manila that enraged then First Lady Imelda Marcos due to its depiction of the city's criminal underbelly. To please Marcos, the film's producer, Regal, altered the title Manila by Night to A City After Dark. However, this did not decrease the film's impact or appreciation for its superb performances. Gil shone out in an ensemble headed by Chirito Solis and Bernardo Bernardo, among others, as Kano, a tomboy addict and small-time drug dealer who became a victim of the martial law era police. When asked to reflect on her career, Gil stated she always remembered the part fondly, only two years after Manila. Gil appeared in Peak Galiga's historical drama, Oro, Plata, Mata, 1982, as Trining Ojeda, an innocent young lady from the Negro's privileged class who is altered by the brutal circumstances of war. She demonstrated her humorous versatility in the popular 1980s TV joke program, Champoy, in addition to her serious roles, then followed the 1985 melodrama that would establish her contrabidat image. Despite her best efforts to stray from it throughout the remainder of her career in Emmanuel Borlase's Bichuing Wal Ong Ning Ning, as the ambitious pop diva Lavinia Argels, she uttered the arrogant phrase, matched by her spilling wine at Sharon Cunita, her competitor in the film, that became legendary in Philippine cinema, you're nothing but a second-rate, trying hard copycat, that sequence, which Gil claimed he improvised has become a fan favorite in the entertainment industry over the years. It was also frequently mocked, even by the actress herself. Lavinia Argels cast her in subsequent, similarly wired villain parts, earning Gil the title, La Primera Contravida, 
that phrase will never be the same again, Kunita stated shortly after Gil's death on social media. The megastar traveled to New York and spent nearly half a day with Gil in her last hours. The business has lost one of its very finest. And I have lost a part of myself that no one will ever replace. I'll be eternally thankful to him for granting us those few hours together. For the love and words we exchanged yet again in person, Kunita stated, Gil had received several prizes for her cinematic work, including the Gawadurian and the Famas. She was as fearsome on stage, triumphing as opera queen Maria Callas in Masterclass in 2008 and fashion icon Diana Vreeland in Full Gallop in 2014, her performances in Galiga and Lor Reyes a Sonata. 2013, and Gabriel Fernandez's If Mana 2014, which reunited her with Aro after Fidi's Quiggin Essential, earned her recognition at international film festivals. Gil, who was born Evangeline Rose Eigenman on May 12, 1963, comes from a family of performers. Each of them has achieved success in their respective fields. Her parents, Eddie Mesa and Rosemary Gill, brothers Michael De Mesa and the late Mark Gill, and nephews and nieces Andy, Gabby, Ryan, Max, Jeff, and Timothy Eigenman, who adopted the professional name Sid Lucero. After his father Mark Gill's memorable lead role in the allegorical fraternity film, Batch 81, are among them. 1982. Gill is survived by her three children, Raphael and Bianca Rogoff, who she had with musician Ronnie Rogoff, and Jeremiah David, who she had with legendary actor-director Leo Martinez. Number 2. Sandy Andalong in 1982 age 23, Christopher and Sandy Andalong celebrated their 42nd wedding anniversary on Instagram. The seasoned actors devoted anniversary tributes to each other on their own accounts. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for the honor and gift of marriage. As well as the joy that comes from sharing our lives together, Sandy said in the description of her Instagram picture which included nostalgic photographs of their times together. We thank you, Abba Father, for bringing us to our 42nd anniversary day, when we recall the vows we made in front of you and hope that you continue to bless our lives together. We pray in Jesus' name, she continued, Love you Ahava, Sandy wrote at the conclusion of her message, tagging Christopher, meanwhile. Christopher shared a snapshot of his wife's welcome. Christopher and Sandy married in 2001, but they had been dating since 1980, Sandy Andalong in 2022 age 63. Number 3. Liza Lorena in 1982 age 32, Miss Liza Lorena is among the great actresses of her generation. Proof of that is her appearances in various television series, which appreciate her ability as a professional actress. Miss Liza Lorena was born Elizabeth Luciano Winsett in the province of Pampanga. Her attractive face and talent gave her the opportunity to become Binibining Pilipinas was the first runner-up in 1966. She entered the world of showbiz and marked her talent when she acted in the famous movie Auro, Plata, Mata as Nene Ojeda. Her performance was recognized and FAP honored her with the Best Supporting Actress Award. In 1986, she won the Best Supporting Actress Award from Gawad Yurian for the movie Miguelito, Ang Batong Rebelled. The then matinee idol Eddie Gutierrez became her boyfriend and Tonten Gutierrez was the result. His son is also a good actor and is with him in Teong Dalawa because of his excellence. Did you know that she is feared in his villainous roles? It's just that, it's not really his trip to her, so the take is said to be new, he's telling his co-stars what they're going to do so that somehow, his co-star won't be beaten badly, but don't you wonder why he still looks like a child? According to Liza, her secret is being happy with what she has in her life, especially since she knows that her children's and grandchildren's lives are in order. That's why even though there is no man in her life, our heroine is still glowing and blooming, Liza Lorena in 2022 age 73, number 4 Fides Quiggin Essential in 1982 age 50, 
Fidis Bel Sacuigan Essential Sacuigan Essential is a Filipino coloratura soprano, actress, director, librettist, translator, and teacher. She was born in Lucina, Philippines on August 1, 1931. Gervasio Santos Cuigan and Jacinta Belsa are her parents. She directed, wrote, acted, and created short musicals and plays throughout the war. She attended Philippine Women's University and earned two degrees, a Bachelor of Arts in English with a specialization in drama in 1950 and a Bachelor of Music with a major in voice and a minor in piano in 1951. Her graduation presentation was well received in 1951. The headline on the main page of the Manila Times read, A Star is Born. More importantly, she was lauded by the Grand Dame Juvita Fuentes, who declared that the little singer will someday take my mantle. Following graduation, she got a scholarship to the Curtis Institute of Music in Pennsylvania, where she earned an artist diploma in voice with specific studies in stage movement and eurythymics in 1955. She married Manuel D. Asensio, Jr. in 1954 and returned to Manila after graduating from Curtis Institute. She has established herself as one of the country's prominent opera performers and producers since 1955. In 1955, she made her operatic debut as Adele in Richard Strauss's Die Fledermaus. She also appeared in a number of world premieres of Filipino operas, including Ramon Santos' Mapilang Bichuin, Eliseo Pajaro's Binhiing Kolayan, Casilag's Dolaroan, and, most memorably, as Saisa in Felipe de Leon's Nolimi Tanher in 1957. She has also performed in Menaudi's The Telephone, Donizetti's Lucia di Lammermoor, Mozart's Die and Furang AUS Dem Surreal, Verdi's La Traviata, Britain's Turn of the Screw, and Debussy's L'Anfon Prodigue, among many other works. She also directed various Filipino and Western opera performances. From 1969 to 1974, she hosted the TV show Sunday Sweet Sunday, and from 1989 to 2002, she hosted A Little Night of Music. She was also in four films, Oro Plata Mata, 1982, Neo, 2011, A Parisian, 2012, and Mana, 2014, Fidis Belsa Quigan Essential in 2022 age 91. Thanks for watching. Guys, please like and hit the bell icon to share the video and subscribe on this channel. Thank you.